I'm the director of the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve here in North Devon um, and I'm also the chief executive officer for the foundation which is the charity which supports all the work that we do. So the Biosphere Reserve is a designation that comes from UNESCO, United Nations and it's all about regions demonstrating best practice in sustainable development and it's linking people and nature so it's um, trying to sort of build that relationship for a more sustainable future is really what the whole program is about. And so that includes whether it is sort of biodiversity, woodlands, wetlands, marine life, etc. And it's also about how businesses and communities live and work in that environment and how to make the relationship much better. The way that ties into today is that um, we've got a, a couple of problems in North Devon. So we have um, tourism pressure, we get four million tourists, but they always come into the coastal areas. And although we know that 80% of them at least are coming for environmental reasons like the landscape, like you know, what the sea, uh, like that experience of getting in the sea. It is all sort of pressured around the coastline and so we've got some of those um, very much hot spots where tourism happens and we're trying to relieve the pressure on some of those hot spots so it gives something different to do for those people so we can divert them around to different places. It also means you can spread the economy a bit further inland so it's not you only make money if you're living on the coast, you've got to try and find a way to make money living inland as well. So the idea of sort of creating a new tourism activity to move that inland is one of the things we're doing with this particular project. And the other problem we have is that a lot of the woodlands in North Devon, well, it happens everywhere, but we know that at least 50% of the farm woodlands um, in particular are not being managed at all. They're just sort of kind of falling into neglect, which from a woodland health point of view and a, from a biodiversity point of view is not the best thing. You can get woodlands you can leave for a long time, you know, and you they get mosses and lichens and fungi, which is great. But you can actually involve a bit of management in that, which then keeps the health from turnover and makes the, the woodland biodiversity that much richer. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit pricey to do that. So by trying to create other products and other means of making money from the woodland, it means that the landowner can get back into the woodland management side of it and get some income from it, and the health of the woodland gets better. So it's so linking those two projects together, what we're trying to do today is find a way to get more people like tourists involved in woodland management so you can create an income from that tourism as well as from the woodland products, which makes it much more viable. And therefore we get the woodlands back in better condition and we have tourists that are moving not just on the coastline but actually coming inland to play in our woodlands. The particular angle we're looking at today is the, the charcoal retort and the idea of that is that we can get um, a good value product from the charcoal that is made in the woodlands. So by owning a retort, so we just bought, I'm, I'm being trained today on how to use it, uh, how to stack it so we can then train other people, is we can take that round to different woodlands and invite tourists to come along, spend a little money to, to be there, to be part of it. Uh, there are some people who just want to pay a wonderful experience of stoking a fire all day, camping in the woods overnight, have some charcoal in the morning, have a barbecue, then go home. It's a great weekend, um, you know, it's kind of wild camping in woods. It's great, it's, it's actually easy, which is fantastic. A lot of the, the very old traditional charcoal kilns take a lot of skill. Um, this one is kind of, the reason we bought it is it, it is very easy to manage. You just got to get the knack of stacking it right and setting it up right, and then once that working, off it goes and you manage the wood, manage the gas, easy, and then you get charcoal the next day. Put the thin stuff at the bottom and then it gets thicker as it goes up. Yeah. So, you know, if it's dry, this is fine on the bottom, but if it's wet, you build up the bottom. Yeah. 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 
Okay, my, uh, my background is aviation, actually. I've spent most of my working life in aviation. Um, uh, but uh, in the last 10, 12 years, um, I've moved from that and into woodland work, in particular the production of retorts and charcoal. The prototype ran in 2011, in April 2011, um, and the first production model was sold in March 2012. A friend of mine, and in fact the designer of the retort, chap called Jeff Self, um, is a king gardener, as am I, and we discussed biochar. He, he mentioned biochar one drunken boxing day, in fact, and uh, we wondered if there was a business in it, so we gave it a go, and the business has developed from that into the production of retorts. Uh, the machine, there's a clue in the name, the Exeter Retort. Uh, the machine is definitely particular to us in the in the um, southwest. It's made here um, and it's distributed from here uh, all over the world. There are machines in America, Sweden, France, Dubai. Um, they go all over the world. The first thing you do uh, is once you've parked your retort up and you've levelled it and it's nice and uh, uh, ready to go, you open both doors um, at both ends. Uh, that's for the inner and outer chamber and you fill the inner chamber as neatly as you can with preferably dry split wood. You then seal, check the seals and seal that chamber up uh, and do the same with the outer doors. You then set a fire, um, the two, well I should explain the two big outer doors have a small firebox door set into the bottom. You uh, then light a fire through those firebox doors. All you have to do then is keep adding waste wood, or whatever your, 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 your fuel wood is, until the temperature, which we're constantly measuring, uh, we're measuring the gas exit temperature from the inner chamber, reaches about 410, 420, uh, and at that point you cap the inner chamber, and that action forces the gas that's being produced in the inner chamber into the firebox. From that point, that gas is very flammable, it's mostly methane, from that point, you need to add no more fuel wood. Producing the charcoal is one thing, but it's it's what it's used for after that. So it can be used for the regular kind of barbecue retail side of things. But the other thing we're looking at is the use of it is biochar. So this is now the sort of the practice that came from sort of South America, where they were they were using charcoal as a um, as a kind of fertilizer enhancer. Um, so there's a lot of people researching what this does, particularly in sort of in Asia. Um, there's a lot of sort of biochar research going on there, what it can do to enhance uh, crop yields, for example. So we're interested in seeing how that applies here. So the biochar or the product, whatever comes out of the kiln, we can use it for, for different purposes. And perhaps out of today's burn, Devon Wildlife Trust might use some of it for their tree nursery to enhance that. But you need to sort of charge it up with a bit of nutrient as well, because it works as, as a way of to uh, if like hold on to nutrients and just release them slowly rather than just one rush. So it can be, can be preventing pollution, which is another big project we have. So the big sales pitch is you know, we've got a, a product here that can do various things and we're using it in a way and developing a way that's going to increase the biodiversity of our woodlands but also get better income for, from tourism for those woodland owners. Mm.